So we do have, I'm sure you saw the silent auction going on, all the baked goods, woodworking, everything that's out there that will be closing during the service. So I was asked that during the first song or two, if you guys still want to go place bids, you guys feel free, to, you don't have to stay in here. You can get up during the songs and go place a bid. There's still a few things that don't have bids on them, so feel free to get up during the first couple songs. And then after that, I think around the time of the sermon, we're gonna close out the auction. So who's ever winning then, maybe it's your best chance now to go make sure you win the item you're looking for. So if you guys wanna stand up, we'll pray and get started with our worship. God, we just thank you for this morning for us to be able to gather in your house to sing praises to you, to listen to scriptures about you, to partake in communion, to give offering, and to just praise you in every which way possible that we can this morning. We praise you for the beautiful weather outside. We praise you for the smiling faces. We praise you for the opportunity to raise money for water wells over in Tanzania. And we just praise you that we get to praise you this morning. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to gather together as one, as a family of believers. We just pray that as this morning, as we sing, as we listen to the sermon, that our minds and hearts are just focused on you so we can lift your name high. We pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Quiet. 
found in your name the power to save. Fully a whisper, mountain shape. Jesus, our hope and strength. You made a way, unlock these chains. Here in your presence, stronghold me. Free by the love you gave. Sing, we give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. can come forward and go ahead and start passing out the communion. So as we come to our time of communion this morning, I wanted to start, well, really just base the communion meditation around a scripture. Um, it's Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, I believe. There it is. It's a little small, so I'm going to read it to you anyway, so if you can't read that, it's okay. So in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in the way in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, 
the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and that is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one man so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And as we take communion, this is the story that we're taking part of. We're saying that we were once dead in our sins, our transgressions. We were following the ways of the world. We were following after darkness. The, we were following the ruler of the kingdom of the air. But then Christ, in his mercy and love, came to earth for us, and as we were singing about, died on a cross for our sins, so that now we can take part in that, and we become part of the kingdom of God. So as we hold our communion in our hands, we're acknowledging that that's what happened. We were, we were dead to our sins, but now we are alive in Christ Jesus. And through that, through taking communion, through recognizing Jesus as our Savior, through baptism, we can do, we are God's handiwork, and we acknowledge that we are created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So if you guys want to go ahead and wrestle through opening your communion cups, if you haven't already, I'll pray, and then we'll take our communion. God, we just praise you and thank you that you brought us out of the darkness. You found us where we were, no matter where that was in sin, and we acknowledge that we once lived in a sinful life, and because of you, because of your sacrifice, we can have freedom, we can live in light, we can live a righteous life because of what you've done. And God, we just ultimately praise you for taking us from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light and letting us live with you and be a part of your throne, a part of your kingdom. So God, as we take communion today, we acknowledge that we still may sin, we still may make the mistakes, but ultimately we are part of your kingdom. So as we take the bread that represents your body, we acknowledge the sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. And then as we take the juice, which represents the blood that was shed. And then I'm also going to take some time for our offering. Um, there's, there's places in the back for you to give offering. You can also give online. But um, I wanted to start, the next song we're going to sing is actually called Give Thanks to God. And we give when we give offering, it's kind of a way of praising him through giving. So as we sing this next song, kind of just focus on the words as kind of part of what offering is. And I'm going to go ahead and pray over the offering as well. God, we thank you for blessings that you give us, whether it be talents that we can use or financial blessings that we can turn back to you. And God, we pray that even in the hard times, financially hard times, we can acknowledge that you are in control. We acknowledge the promises that you have made for us, that you will provide for us. If you can provide for the birds, you can provide for us, God. And we trust that as we give our finances to you. And we just pray that you take that money and bless it and multiply it for the work of your kingdom as we serve you. Amen. Ending love is 
steadfast and sure hope. Broken our chains and given us freedom. Give thanks to God, for He is good. In Him we are alive and have joy. Any of you ever get distracted with things? I know Cameron mentioned just a few moments ago as you wrestle with your communion cups. I start as soon as I get my cup. Because that top cover, and you know, today I couldn't see it, I couldn't feel it, and it was frustrating me. But it's for such a good cause, you know. <laughs> We're taking the communion of Jesus Christ, and yet some little clear-coated... That thing right there, you all know what I'm talking about, right? It frustrates the snot out of me. How easily we get distracted by those things. And this last week I've been reminded of that for the last few days since about Wednesday. I started having an earache. And right now this side of my head, my ear is closed off from an infection. So there's this ringing. You guys know that, like in music, when you hear the background, that, that noise? That's what I hear right now. And so like this morning, I've been frustrated. I'm trying to listen to people. I can't hear them quite well. Uh, but God is good. Amen. And I'm not going to be distracted by that. And so with that thought in mind, today as you come into church to worship the Most High God, I want you to think on what is it that's been distracting you this week? What is it that's been keeping you away from the knowledge and the truth of who Jesus Christ is? Because I know there's something in every one of you. 
Maybe it's some frustration that you're dealing with in, in work or some frustration with family or a relationship or just something. What, what is in your mind and heart right now that might be uh, holding you back from the authentic worship of the Lord God Most High? And with that in mind, I want to pray and pray over that as we go into study. Father, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. You are so worthy of it. There is none like you, God. There never will be any like you. You are God, the Most High, the one that spoke all of this that we see into creation and everything we don't see into creation. God, we pray for your strength. We pray for your Holy Spirit. We pray for your guidance as we study your word today to open our eyes and our hearts to worship you with everything we have to be unhindered by the, the distractions and, and to put those things at bay that only you, Lord Jesus, can do. I pray right now for the truth of your word to be revealed clearly and that we would be a part of that worship in the study of your word. It's in your almighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, as you can see on the screen here, we've been going through this series of attitudinal awareness. I like saying that word. You guys want to say it with me? Attitudinal it just sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? But it's all about our attitude. And so often when we face life situations, our attitudes tend to be off at different points. And just as we were talking about with distractions, so often we get distracted by the littlest of things. Like someone here in this church family, I don't know who it is. Let me just look around here for just a second. But somebody almost consistently, not today, probably because they knew I was going to say something, but always wants to leave this side door open. And if it's not all the way open, they want to leave it cracked. That drives me nuts. Because it's a distraction. And you know, we as Christian men and women, we don't want to do anything to distract anybody from the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I understand it's an attitude thing. And if my attitude probably was a little more focused, maybe I wouldn't be distracted by that. But you and I in this house, we have been given one assignment on this earth. Do you know what the scripture says that one assignment is? It says literally it is to bring glory to God. Well, how do we do that? Well, we do it by the way we're sitting in church today. We do it by the way we apply our minds and hearts to him. We do it by the way we work. We do it by the way we sing praises. We do it in all of our different activities of life. We live a life of worship. In the scriptures today, we're going to be looking at what Paul says in chapter 3, the first 11 verses. Uh, if we have been paying attention over the last few weeks, talked about Paul talks about us having the attitude of that of Jesus Christ, that as Christians we are to shine like the stars with the truth of the hope of Jesus Christ that's in us, that we shouldn't walk around on this earth acting like everybody else or looking like everybody else because we are the children of the Most High God. We've been set apart for a purpose, and that purpose is to show who Jesus is. Uh, oftentimes, we may get distracted or lose sight of that, and sometimes we don't always look the image of Jesus. So how do we overcome that? Today, we're going to be talking about just some memory things, some reminders, some ways of uh, uh, getting us back on track when we're off track or when we're distracted by the things of this life. The first two verses of this passage says, Finally, my brothers... Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those uh, dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. A couple of real important things. Number one, our safeguard is rejoicing in the Lord. What's a safeguard? Well, it's something put in place to protect us. And literally, Paul reminds us or tells us once again, no matter what we're facing, no matter what distractions, no matter what problems we're going through, our safeguard is to rejoice in the Lord. I say probably one of the best exercises we could ever do is when we're facing a very difficult, bad situation, say we've been up at night, we're in tears, we're dealing with something, one of the best things you could do Go lock yourself in the bathroom or someplace alone and just sing praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I can imagine probably in some of your minds you're saying, well, man, I don't feel like doing that when I'm in that situation. What does he call it? He says it's our safeguard. And I practice, have practiced this over the years, probably not as much as I should, but there have been times I can recall real quick in life when I thought my life was completely falling apart 
I found my place of solitude and sang the praise of Jesus even when I didn't feel like it, even sometimes as I was crying. And guess what started to take place? My attitude, my mind, my heart started to be focused and centered on God once again, and those things started to fade away that was such a big deal to me. This is the promise of God's word that it is a safeguard. Now, the other part of what it said in those verses was to watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil. Literally, Paul here is saying, those mutilators of the flesh, he calls them dogs. You know, he puts a name on them that they're offensive, that they are doing things that are not right. And when we speak in reference to this in these first couple of verses, uh, we're going to hear some terminology like circumcision, which it was a practice of the Jewish Hebrew people, uh, you know, that they practiced to show that they were gods. Now, his reference here is people can do those kind of things, but they can be mutilators of the flesh. What does that mean? Well, it means simply this, and, and to put in perspective for us here, we can come to church and not be a part of church. Do you catch what I'm saying? We can come to church and claim to be of Christ, but not live for Christ. Or not be surrendered to Christ. You know, it's the old idea that, you know, if I go park myself in a, in a car garage, it doesn't make me a car. Same thing as going and parking myself in a church doesn't make me a Christian. What makes me a Christian? Well, I am a man that has surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. And I was baptized in my Lord and Savior. And I worship my Lord and Savior. And I live for him on a daily basis. Living in that obedience, that relationship, that truth is what makes a person a Christian because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. These mutilators of the flesh that Paul's referring to is people that practice religion but do not practice the relationship of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he talks about how they will steer people away from the truth of who Jesus is. Now, as we read on in the next few verses, starting with verse 3, it says that it's for... It, for it is we who are the circumcision. We who worship by the Spirit of God. We are who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. And here's where he's kind of making some of that clarification. For you and I that claim Jesus Christ, if we worship him, this is who he's talking about. We are the ones that... Not just a physical circumcision, but a circumcision of the heart. Not just a practice of religion, but a relationship that sustains us. You know, for me, when we come into church here on a Sunday morning, I think we're just gathering for a, a kind of a pep talk, a reminder, a uh, kind of the huddle that you would talk about on the team or the, the business meeting. Because what we're referencing here is that we are Christian men and women, and we have a job and responsibility to do to get out there and glorify Jesus Christ so that other people can see who he is and come to the light of knowing Jesus Christ. So when we're here we're here simply to have this time of reverence and worship to God, and then we get back out to work, worshiping the Lord outside of this church building. But oftentimes, people's mentality is, is that when they walk into church, that's when they're going to start worshiping God. I got a word for that. Anybody know it? Hogwash. Our worship is our lifestyle. We didn't come into church today to begin worshiping. We came into church today to continue our worship and to praise and worship him. And Paul goes on to say here, these mutilators, these dogs that he referenced, he said, though I myself, talking about Paul, has every reason to put confidence in the flesh. And that was the main part of this. Our confidence is not in flesh. We have to remember that when we're sitting here in a church service. Our confidence is not in uh, of ourselves it's not in and of our family. It's not in and of anything else but Jesus Christ. And this is a reminder we continually hear through these 11 verses. The rest of verse 4 said, If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, here Paul goes, and he's going to state his reasons for having confidence. I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. How do those words play out in your own mind? 
You know, a lot of us probably aren't going to reference necessarily what Paul did, but Paul was saying, I am a Jew among Jews. I was born into the faith. I lived as a Jewish man. I was the real deal. Not only that, I studied to be a Pharisee. I was, my zeal, I was persecuting the Christians because they didn't stand for what the Jews stood for at that time. And so he put all this down on paper. But how's that relate in our own minds? Well, it'd be statements like this. Hey, Guys, I've grown up in the church. I never missed a Sunday of church. You know, while others of you were going off doing other things, I went to church every single Sunday. I put in offering every single Sunday. I did all the stuff that a good Christian boy should do. My hope shouldn't be in those things. Now, those are true statements. But I'm not saying today that I'm any better than anybody else in this room because of any of that stuff. Well, we come to find, and what we're getting ready to read more of here in the scriptures is what Paul talks about, is even though he had every confidence in the flesh, his confidence in flesh means nothing. And that's what Paul came to find out. You guys remember what took place? His conversion on the road to Damascus, literally made blind. An angel of the Lord speaks to him, or God speaks to him directly and says, Listen, you're persecuting me, Jesus. And his eyes were open to the spiritual reality. See, I think a lot of people gather in churches on Sunday mornings and they think that they're gathering in church for physical reasons. We know that's not true. We know that there is a spiritual battle going on. We know it's happening in our culture, in our world. We know that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against Satan and his powers, the world, the darkness. We know that there literally are angels and demons here on this earth. And that this war is going on. And yet so often religious people walk around blindly saying, man, I wish something would change. Man, I wish my kids were better. Man, I wish they were in church. Instead of being on our knees in prayer to the Lord Most High. You know, we literally have that description in the scriptures that when we get on our knees and pray, we're dealing with the true weapons of war. And that's what I see when I look out here. Warriors for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men and women that will pray in the confidence and the truth of who Jesus is for the salvation of our family members, of our community. Verse 7 goes on. But whatever was for my prophet, this is here again Paul speaking, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss to compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. So what did Paul say there? It's all rubbish compared to Christ. All the things, all the stuff, all the materialism, all the religious, religious activity, all of that is rubbish to knowing who Jesus Christ is. Today we get a real good reminder of that out here in the foyer, which can be kind of distracting, walking by all these pies, brownies, beautiful creations, all these wonderful things. Don't get distracted by that. Don't look back here. It's back here right now. Don't be distracted by it. But we think about all that stuff. Well, what is that for? Well, we know that, we're, that we've done those things or we use those talents to bring resources for this water project in Kalindi. Literally, I could probably stand up here and tell you, it's probably going to be five to 10,000 people receiving clean water from a project like that. We're probably going to see hundreds, if not thousands, of people surrender their lives to Jesus Christ because of that precious gift that we're willing to pour out in that way. That's amazing. But you know, this morning, I was thinking on those things, and I was seeing all the work everybody was doing. I, Praise God, that's awesome. It's great to see the family of God come together in a way like that. But for myself, in a very personal way, the way it all began for me was one day, probably a decade ago, I can remember sitting in my office, staring at my computer in my office, and I was having a prayer time, and I was saying, Lord God, someday, someday when I get it all together, someday when I have better money or resources, someday when I have less responsibility, I am going to go and do some things for the kingdom of God for you. I'm going to build something. I'm going to be something. I'm, whatever it is, Lord, I'm going to do it. And I can remember sitting there in that office and all of a sudden having the Holy Spirit commune with me and say, what's wrong with today? 
And I remember breaking down in tears, literally, and saying, I am so sorry. You've given us all the resources, Lord. Our opportunity is now. It's not tomorrow. And as Christian men and women, we're not putting our hope and trust in tomorrow. We're putting our hope and trust in today. And the Lord of today is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tomorrow, again, will be today, and that's the Lord's. But when we mentally and constantly put off, and when we sit in church service, and we mentally and put off saying that tomorrow I'm going to get my life straight with God, tomorrow I'm going to get right with Jesus, tomorrow I'm going to do something better, i got a word for that. And it's one that Satan probably created, hogwash, that's right. For when we do those kind of things, we're only rejecting the power and truth of who Jesus is, and instead allowing him to come in and invade our hearts and souls and to make us a new creation. The last part of these verses goes on and says, And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God is by faith. And this reminder for us again, not a righteousness by law, but by Jesus Christ. So, understand this, if you're not following real clear up to this point it's not the amount of attendance in church service that saves it's not the amount of money that you put in the offering plate that saves, it's not the amount of prayers, it's not the amount of any of those things that saves, there's only one thing that saves and we know that truth and that truth is Jesus Christ that alone, Jesus is the one who saves, now the byproduct of the saving relationship is that I'm going to want to spend time with him. I'm going to want to serve him. I'm going to want to show my gl- the, the glory that he deserves through my life. And that's reflected by the way we live. Understanding this, and I've been in the ministry for a few decades now, and I've been around churches for a long time. Oftentimes, the biggest hindrance to the growth of the church or evangelism is the way that we live outside the church building. Do you know what I mean by that? And I understand, I'm not saying this, you know, I'm not pointing fingers or anything. But how often have we had times that maybe somebody invited us to church or we thought of church and we say, well, doesn't so-and-so go there? Because I've seen them at work and stuff. Man, they sure don't act like they know Jesus. You ever heard those kind of things? Evangelism in Jesus Christ is to be a natural overflow of the life that we live glorifying Jesus. If we're living in that relationship, that safe relationship with Jesus Christ, it should be transforming and changing us in such a way that everything we do is a reflection of his beauty and his glory, and people are going to be drawn to that and want that. The fuel for that is this phrase right up here. It's not the righteousness that my giving, serving, praying is. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you guys remember that quick test? Who remembers the test? On that scale of 1 to 10, how righteous do you all feel this morning? All right, we've got some very positive individuals up here. But we know the reality of that question, and, and, and what it's meant to do is to check us If I was basing things on my own righteousness, I'm probably going to say that I'm a three or a four. You know, my righteousness, I I know my thoughts, I know the things I've done, I know the people I've hurt. So I might say that my righteousness is a three or four. But if I ask the question on a scale of one to ten, what is the righteousness of Jesus? Does anybody have any difficulty answering that? You know, we all say, well, Jesus Christ was perfect. His righteousness was completely a ten. And yet in the scriptures that we see reminded of here right now, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is where we put our faith and our hope, not in our own personal righteousness. So when we put on Jesus, when we surrender our life to Jesus, we now are the ambassadors of Christ. We're the ones that display his glory and honor. So when we say, what is our righteousness? Our righteousness is Jesus. And if our righteousness is Jesus, how righteous do you feel? This is where you say, I'm a 10. Satan uses identity as one of his main weapons to destroy the abilities of the church. Do you understand what that means? 
I mean, so often we lose or get distracted or, or have things that are bothering us or we look at our own impurities or our own unrighteousness and Satan will use that to take a moment and say, are you really a Christian? Hmm. Do you really believe what you said? You know, and he'll start putting all those thoughts and questions in our mind. And that's a point. What is our safeguard? What's our safeguard? What's our safeguard? To rejoice in the Lord. And so what we do when we have those reminders that, that stuff happening where Satan's attacking us, uh, questioning our identity. Well, then we go, I am a child of God. I've been bought with the most high's blood. I belong to him. I'm the royalty of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know my identity. I am saved by him. I will not question my salvation. I know I belong to him. I'm going to worship him. I'm going to rejoice in him. And when you hear those things in your mind, I can't do it. They're, oh, you know, pastor says some really nice things up there today. But for me, it's all in the future. I can't do that right now. Yes, you can in Jesus. And so... We see the picture of that. Uh, we see the things in the foyer. Taking our talents and our gifts to use them to the glory of God. Whatever that looks like. I know there's been individuals here that have given money not for the well project, but for Bibles to be bought in Swahili. Praise God. Do you know right now, I know Pastor Manuel, Daniel, all of them... A lot of them are having church service right at this exact same time. Now, it's night service there, but they're having service right now. I consider that our church family. Even though they're across on the other side of the hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, they're still our church family united through Jesus Christ. Now, this last part of what we look at, it is by the grace of Jesus Christ, not by our own righteousness that we have confidence. He goes on to say, the last two verses of this section... I want you to know Christ. Uh, if you're not familiar, that Greek word there for know is this intimate relationship. And, you know, we've used those illustrations and ideas before, but how often have you heard somebody say, oh, I know them? Well, there's a difference between knowing somebody's name or what they look like versus truly knowing somebody. Knowing what they're about, what they stand for, and things of that nature. You know, the uh, I mentioned earlier uh, in, in Sunday school, I had an uh, individual, a worker this week, that was um, using some foul language and uh, telling some off-color jokes to me. And, and uh, I wasn't laughing. I wasn't participating. And, and then someone else says, do you know that he's a pastor? Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I wouldn't have talked that way. I wouldn't have said those things if I'd known you were a pastor. Any of you ever need those reminders? Do you realize how absolutely ridiculous that sounds? All of us in this room knows that God is present with us in all places, in all locations, and just because all of a sudden a pastor or a preacher is around isn't time to watch our potty mouths. What we need to check is our heart. We know that. We don't have, need anybody to remind us or tell us that. But so often we have that mentality of, oh, oh, you know, I'm in church right now. I better act different. Listen, the way we're to act outside of this place is the same way we're to act inside. If you can't say it in here, you best not be saying it out there. Where is the problem with evangelism? If we have the mentality that today we had to get cleaned up, change the way we act, change our words to be able to be present in church, then what's happening outside of this building? Because I can tell you this. This building burns down this week. The church remains. This is a building. It's expendable. You are not. We are the church of the living God, Jesus Christ. Wherever we go, we're the representation of that. He said, verse 10, I want you to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. This goes back to that Greek word, which is skenosko, which means that 
I want to know Jesus in such a way that my mind, my attitude, my heart, when I pray, I'm praying the will of God. You know, I can remember, and I'm a pastor that believes that we're to pray for even the smallest of things. You know, Evelyn, this last Wednesday, she wanted us to pray that we would find that she would find her glasses. I believe God cares about that. Again, just that quick reminder, it tells us in Scripture that God literally knows the amount of hairs that are present in the room. Hairs. Mine are kind of stuck together. Any of you use gel like that? It feels like glue up there or something. God knows how many hairs are on our heads. You think he's concerned about us when we're lost our glasses? Yeah. And he wants that intimate relationship where we are open to pray like that. But he also teaches us to pray his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what's that mean? Well, is it any big question what God's will is? God's will is for all men and women to be saved through the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and that we are the reflection and the glory of that. So if I'm praying according to God's will, I'm praying for the salvation of my brothers and sisters. I'm praying for the salvation of my enemies. I'm praying for all people. I'm praying for people I've never met. I'm going to be a reflection of that and be the glory to step out in faith and do those things. Amen. That's a great thing. All of that is fueled by what Paul is writing in these 11 verses. To know the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection. Now, you won't have to necessarily raise your hand on this one, but how many of you know the saving power of Jesus or have salvation in Jesus Christ? Do you know the power of his resurrection? Let that question really sink in your head. Has it changed things? Or do you still look at life the same way? Are you still trying to figure out the problems in the same kind of way? Or are you a man of God now, a woman of God that prays in all situations? That when problems are happening, you go to your safeguard of praising and worshiping and rejoicing in Jesus Christ. Also know, when we say rejoice in Jesus Christ, what is it to rejoice? Turn away, that's that idea of repentance. But as we rejoice, think on that. It's, it's praising, but what is the base of the praising when we say rejoice? It's thankfulness, gratitude. Uh, we talk about an attitude of gratitude, that nice little rhyme. That's what we're talking about. Our safeguard is to rejoice in Christ, which is turning away, which is worshiping Jesus Christ, which is loving him in spite of all things else. Now, this is what the last part of this says. All I want to know is to know Jesus. And this is, I think probably most of you already understand this, but this is where we try to drive home for us each Sunday is that until Jesus Christ becomes everything you want to know at the core of everything you want to know, then everything else is going to be expended or, you know, have troubles and problems. Now, I'm not saying that as a Christian man or woman, when you give your life to Jesus Christ, everything just turns into rosebuds and beauty and all that. It's not like we don't have problems, but we know the source of our happiness. We know the source of our joy. We know the truth of Jesus Christ. We know that our eternity is secure through the deposit of the Holy Spirit in us. We know that we have salvation waiting for us, eternal in heaven. So we look at things differently. We'll end on this one, but this is one I think a lot of you have heard before. You know, we got two folk, and they, we always talk about the one guy that got his 50 bucks extra at work that week, driving home on Friday night. He's excited. He's got that extra $50 bonus, gets a flat tire. So he curses God because now the extra $50 he had, he has to spend on a tire rather than whatever else he wanted to spend it on. You got the other guy on the other side of the table. He got that extra $50 bonus at work that week. He gets a flat tire, and he sits there and praises God. 
because God had blessed him with $50 to be able to fix his tire. Do you see the two differences? Yeah, it's that attitude of gratitude. It's that one that looks at the me, I, myself, this situation versus the other that turns everything back to praise. So I've been trying to practice that myself. Uh, I've had a lot of late nights this week. Uh, the last few nights I've been sleeping maybe two or three hours a night, that ringing, that sometimes it feels like, you know, somebody's sticking a knife in my ear or something. You know, it was really good times, let me tell you. But as I was thinking on that, you know, I think about, all right, praise and worship God. Worship him no matter what. Uh, it's okay. You know, and praise God, it, it will heal. It will be restored. And so my mind starts thinking on things like, yeah, well, praise God that it's happening now and not when I'm on a plane going into Tanzania or something like that. And what does this remind me of? Well, you know, that constant ringing in my ears reminding me not to be distracted, but to stay focused on who Jesus Christ is. Um, there, we all have things here this day that are distracting us. We need to get back on track. We need the reminder. We need that, uh, that coach up there telling us, get back in the game, do your job. That's what I love in Timothy when it talks about, he talks about a farmer, he talks about a soldier, and he talks about an athlete. And he uses a description of each of those. And he says, especially of like the soldier, he says of a soldier, they don't get caught up in the menial civil affairs they stick to what their task is and what they're, they're told to do. Why do you think he would give us a picture like that? So often we get caught up in the worldly stuff going on around us and we lose track of what's most important. Do you know there's a passage in the scripture that tells us quite literally, use your money to gain friends. Now, oh, 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 let's make sure we're reading that in context. The context of that is speaking to using the resources that God has given us to gain friends in Jesus Christ, meaning that we're using the resources God has given us to bless other people, to save people, to show them the glory of Jesus. So last and foremost, all I want to know is to know Jesus. Would you bow your heads and we'll pray that. Father. God, we give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you once again for the opportunity to worship you. We want to come to this house to give to you everything that, that we have, all the hope, all the th uh, thanksgiving, all the resources that you provide. We give it back. We praise you. We worship you. We want to be used by you. We want to be available to you. I pray that the truth and the knowledge of you, Jesus Christ, would be on each of these men and women. <laughs> If anyone has not changed or, or claimed you as Lord and Savior, that they would here in this house this day uh, confess your name here publicly. It's in your almighty name, Jesus Christ, that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Would you please stand as our praise team leads us in a time of invitation. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ, this is a time to confess his name publicly and be baptized in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to confess before him. Uh, if there's something that's on your heart that you want to kneel here at these altars, and pray about between you and God, we encourage you to step out of faith to do that as well.
out there in the foyer uh, all of those proceeds will be used in that Kalindi well project the big news on that is we're at full funding as far as the water project itself the funding that comes in from anything we take in today will start going towards the foundation of a physical church building there on site that they'd be able to use and worship so yeah <laughs> A lot of good items out there, so make sure I, I, I think the way it works is you put it on there. If you're the high, highest person listed, then at the end, which it ends in 15 minutes from about now, so about 10 till 12, 5 till 12, we'll wrap up. If you stick around, you can grab whatever you put your money on, all right? So that's the way it works. So is that right? Anyone? You'll have an opportunity directly after service to continue to <laughs> give your money. Put it down on it. I'm having a hard time hearing, so if you said something else, that's okay. <laughs> uh, youth group kickoff is today right after church service. It starts. Uh, they're having lunch. It's for 6th grade through 12th grade. So if you fit into that category, stay after church for lunch. Uh, Bible study again, 930 this uh, coming Wednesday, and I'll be back in the fellowship hall. And then we have soup kitchen coming up in a... Uh, a little over a week, August 23rd. Um, 
and then small group kickoff will be on September 4th. Was well, there any other announcements or things I missed? Oh, All right, that's good. I'd like to say we, some of you know we ordered a new soundboard a year ago. We finally got installed. And I just wanted to say we had guys from Central Christian Church in town, so I kind of wanted to just say to you guys, they helped us out a ton. So I wanted to like thank them in front of all you guys so you guys know the way that churches around the community help us, we help them, and we all serve together. So 